Thanks. So we're going to do the case studies now. Um, uh, this patient is, again, end-stage liver disease, um, infiltrative HCC, uh, multiple deptase procedures, presented with 10 out of 10 pain uh, in low back. Um, the pain corresponded with the physical exam. There was tenderness in the lower lumbar area, no neurological deficits, pain was, was worse with motion. Um, medical management didn't do much really, and the patient has not had radiation. So um, here's an example of uh, L5, no, relatively normal CT. I mean, there is some anterior thesis, but then uh, at the presentation, you can see that the whole vertebral body is, uh, is really tumor infiltrated. That's proven on post contrast MR with epidural extension. Uh, there is slight canal narrowing there as well. So what is the goal of treatment? I mean, I, I don't think anybody will argue that we can treat this uh, and sterilize this vertebral body, but we can ablate as much as possible. We can try to ablate as much as possible of the posterior elements so that we can prevent posterior tumor extension um, and prevent nerve root compression. Desiccation of tissue, I really like desiccation of tissue. It helps me with cement deposition. It's anecdotal, There's, but that's just my experience. And that's the RFA part. And then the kyphoplasty part is really, uh, after I've done that, is to reinforce the vertebral body to treat the fracture. Um, so it um, doesn't project very well, but this is approach, posterior approach, and the fluoroscopy, unipedicular. Now, when you're dealing with the entire vertebral body, a lot of people advocate uh, bipedicular approach, and um, uh, it, it can be helpful. It specifically can be helpful when you have a tumor that chars quickly and you need to do multiple overlapping ablations. You can go from one side back and forth to the other. Um, while you do that, you can clean the electrode uh, of the char tissue, so that can help. But I felt like in this particular case, I could cross to the other side of the vertebral body, and then you can actually cross to the ipsilateral side as well. This is the um, radio frequency ablation device with the center of ablation being right at that sort of loosened area. Um, you can extend it to the upper lower aspects of the vertebral body. Really wonderful maneuver capability within uh, the spine, uh, as you can see, going to the upper and lower um, end plates. And then we start feeling cement. So here is the uh, anterior picture of the cement deposition. And then here is posterior. As you grow that ball, it goes from the anterior and then travels posteriorly. And this is probably where we should have stopped, uh, but we decided to give it just a little bit more um, just to fill that vertebral body posterior. And you can see that we got this um, cement a little bit in the posterior aspect of the vertebral body. Uh, just to reinforce the safety margins, the medial aspects of the pedicles is really you shouldn't try to get uh, either midline osteotome or your TRFA device outside of that midline uh, uh, pedicle uh, level and then um, really try to uh, concentrate your cement in the anterior two thirds of the vertebral body, trying to spare the two th posterior two thirds. Sometimes I would get close, but I really keep in mind that neural foramina, um, as in this case, you can see that this uh, unfortunate uh, case where the cement extravasated into the neural foramina and then gave patient compression deformity. This is just to alert you uh, that cement is viscous, but y you know. It is in your hands. So you, if you push more, you will extravasate out of the vertebral body. Were you trying to fill the pedicle in this case? No, we weren't trying to fill the, fill the pedicle in this case. This was more of a debulking type of situation. Where more, more, cement more cement in the posterior aspect really shouldn't have. Really, in retrospect, we should have stopped but it right was here. Tumor, I'm sorry? There was tumor filling the entire vertebral body, yeah. This was more of a debulking procedure and treatment of the pathologic compression fracture rather than sterilization of the vertebral body. Uh, this is a follow-up post-treatment. Um, here's another case, a 61-year-old woman with low back pain, acute onset, no neurological deficit, pain was, was uh, worse with motion, again, sort of pain at rest and with motion. Um, physical exam correlated to really sort of iliac crest level around L4. Um, again, past medical history and stage liver disease years ago, got liver transplant, now um, had adenocarcinoma of unknown origin. Um, also, unfortunate case, you can see that L4 vertebral body, that's tumor infiltrated. Um, you can see the break through the cortex in the lateral aspect. You can see the retroperitoneal lymph nodes as it's just incidental, and then soft tissue component extending outside of the vertebral body. So here, 
I would like to sterilize the vertebral body as much as possible, uh, really, especially the posterior aspects of it. Um, not to forget that there are nerve roots traveling in this location from the levels above. Um, this was one of the patients that we would, uh, oh, before I say uh, what happened during the procedure, um, that's one of the ways I, I try to plan the procedure. So one of the uh, doctors asked me uh, during the break, do I use CT or I use a fluoro? Uh, so for upper elements, I try to use a fluoro as much as possible, like above T5, T4. For the lower levels, um, I use either, but when I do use a fluoro, I take my measurements of the CT to fluoro. So in this particular situation, the way I did the case is that I plan out the radius of two by three centimeters, placing it over the tumor, and then I figure out where the center of ablation would be, uh, and it would be like in, in this spot right here. So then I take this spot and I make measurements, how far away is it from the midline, how away, far away is it from the anterior aspect, how far away is it from the superior inferior um, aspect of the retrieval body, and then I try to place it in the same pattern on the, uh, on the floor to reproduce the location. And the nice thing about this being uh, maneuverable within the vertebral body is because if I'm off a little bit, I can bend it to one side to the other to get it closer. So here is me placing that. And uh, in this particular case, um, we did, as we always do, we tried to do midline osteotome to the contralateral aspect of the vertebral body. And you can see it kind of tried to fill, but it didn't. So then I was kind of uh, left with the option of uh, should I or should I not uh, go on to the other pedicle and fill it uh, with cement. If this was uh, truly, if this was osteoporotic vertebral <coughs> compression fracture, I probably would do that. But the other side of the vertebral body looks absolutely normal. Um, and I didn't feel like that would be necessary. Nothing happened to this patient um, in regards to this uh, level. She didn't fracture. Uh, she did um, pass on a few months later, but from her overall disease. But that's how basically I do the procedures. I take the CT data measurements and I take them to flora. Or if I do it off the CT, then it's just right there and then I make the measurements on it. Yes? Do you have access to comb beam CT? Do you ever use that access? So I have, I have used comb beam CT. You could do that. Um, I find it a little bit cumbersome. Um, I, like I said, all of my patients get MRI and CT prior to the procedure. It's easy for me to reproduce these measurements really off flora, between the CT and flora. So um, I do that. I've, I've, I've used Combicity in a couple of occasions, just for fun, mostly. You find it that much more um, I, don't, I, I don't think it gives me any um, more information other because I know what CT is, I know what the device looks like, and I know where the center of ablation is. So I really know exactly where it is in the vertebral body, just by measurements. I, I did do a Combim CT. I, I, don't have, I didn't bring that case on, on occasion, and it just re re reinforced what I was thinking. But it looked nice, and then all this rotation looked really pretty. I think it would have made a nice slide. A um, 72-year-old man with mid-back pain, acute and onset pain with motion. Uh, physical exam, again, focal tenderness in the mid-back area, and stage liver disease with history of HCC, status post-taste. Um, this guy actually was a golfer, um, and uh, his biggest issue is that he couldn't golf. And you can see the uh, tumor infiltrating um, the vertebral body um, on the uh, right side and then extending through the pedicle posteriorly. So this one, you actually look at the CT, you can see that the entire vertebral body is normal and the tumor is really confined to the posterior right aspect of the vertebral body, but there is a cleft that going through. And um, I felt that that's the cleft that was giving the patient pain, really. That was the motion-related pain. And then the tumor definitely needed to be treated. It's hard to get all the way posteriorly in this situation. And again, with a wake patient, it's, it's OK. But you are getting those uh, ner ner neuroforamina. I don't think you can see. You can see the neuroforamina right here, and the tumor extending into the neuroforamina. There is absolutely no way not to get that nerve root by ablation, because the tumor is infiltrating the nerve root. Is it a big deal? It's not a modern nerve root, but it does serve uh, a patchy distribution of numbness, which is really uncomfortable for the patient. So that was going to be our stopping point. If they're going to start feeling the irritation along this, I don't remember which level it was, but whatever level it is, if they start irritation along that level, we would stop. And so we started doing the ablation, started from the distal end, curving the needle back and forth, really um, hard to get that needle into the vertebral body by itself. You really need to create, if you really wanted to get into this vertebral body and ablate inside this vertebral body, you need to get that uh, uh, introducer needle inside the vertebral body and then 
introduce this device through the needle, otherwise it will be hard to penetrate the bone itself, especially the interface between the lytic and normal bones is often fairly hard. So that's what we did. We ablated here in multiple configurations, ablated back. Um, luckily, it involved only part of the pedicle. Mostly, it was sort of um, lateral and deeper to the uh, transverse process. And, uh, and that's what we did. And then we, we started filling the cement. Um, the controllability of cement is nice in the sense that it went along the fracture site and stayed there. But this tumor really has, um, tumor has margins, but the tumor in the bone uh, destroyed all the margins. So the cement is started leaking all the way this way, and it's just not going to be confined within that area. But do we really need to put cement anymore at that point? I mean, part of the pedicle is preserved. Most of the vertebral body is preserved, and the contralateral pedicle is preserved. So more likely than not, this vertebral body is going to be stable, um, even if we don't fill it with cement. Let's say we did fill it with cement here, for example. Will, would that give stability? I, I don't think so, because it needs to articulate on the lateral margin, but it doesn't articulate really with the lateral margin. So my goal in this case was not really to fill the whole tumor with cement. My goal was to treat the tumor with the radiofrequency ablation, but also fill the fracture plane with cement. That was the goal of therapy in this situation. He went on golfing, actually, uh, a couple of days after the procedure, was very, very happy. Six or seven months later, he had diffuse metastatic disease throughout vertebral bodies and didn't do very well. Any questions so far? 34-year-old uh, um, graduate student at USC found to have metastatic disease lung cancer to the brain. And then uh, that was his presenting, <laughs> presenting uh, symptom. Uh, he is a non-smoker. Um, and, then, and then later on developed pain in T1. He also had pain at L2. I'm sorry, he had the vertebral body lesion at L2, but no pain. But the pain really was at T9 with a very subtle pathologic compression fracture. He also had pathologic fractures at C7 and T2, but they were treated with uh, radiation therapy. The T9 was not treated, and then it came to us. And you can see that this uh, tumor is focal, it's small, and it involves sort of upper left aspect of the vertebral body, close to midline. So here, um, you, we could offer him cure of that vertebral body, uh, whatever it means for lung cancer, unfortunately. So. Um, that's the corresponding MRI. And uh, the way we targeted, again, I made all the measurements of the CT. I don't have the measurements here, but I laid out all, created the circle, figured out what's the ablation size that I needed. Here's my spinous process. And you can see the spinous process, you can see anterior and superior and inferior aspects of the vertebral body. So it's really easy to take those measurements. Um, in order to treat this tumor, I really don't need to get the margin beyond the vertebral body. There is no necessity to do that because there is no tumor beyond the vertebral body. Really stopping at the vertebral body is okay. Um, and so with this device, if you do the 2 by 3 centimeter ablation with the 1015 device, you'll get about 5 millimeters off anteriorly from your uh, needle. This is, was about 4 millimeters. So we, we tried to get it as close as possible. We ablated that aspect of the vertebral body. <laughs> And this is our post demonstrating. And then we filled with cement. And that demonstrates um, the treated uh, area. What we've noticed on the post MRI is that not infrequently, if you get it too early, there is going to be enhancement at the margins of the ablation. That's not necessarily means it's a residual tumor. It's probably hyperemia. From It just depends on how early you get. We got it very early. I can't remember, but it must have been uh, a week or so. And then. Um, uh, the other thing we notice is that, that there is abnormal uh, uh, T2 signal around there as well, uh, probably corresponding to hyperemia in that area as well. So that's a short tau uh, inversion recovery image here, demonstrating that. That's all for my case study. <laughs>